and welcome everyone. I'm Tom Boley, Chief Market Strategist at EarningsBeats.com, and this is Trading Places Live. It's Tuesday, July 12th, 2022, and I'm pre-recording this Trading Places Live for a bit later this morning. Uh, currently, futures are down. Uh, had a little bit of a rough day on Monday. We'll talk about that in just a minute. But uh, currently, we do have futures uh, pointing to a little bit of a lower open. Uh, we did get some positive earnings news out of PepsiCo. This morning, they beat on their top and bottom line, raised guidance. We'll look at that chart later in the show as well. Uh, before we get into any of that, let's go through today's agenda. So we'll start off with that daily market recap, jump into talking technically, sector performance, uh, earnings spotlight, and the three you must see. Uh, so before we get into any of that, let me take you over to earnings beats quickly. Just to let you know, we do have our max pain event. That's a once a month event. Taking a look at options uh, as we go into option expiration Friday for monthly options. Um, we like to have an event the Tuesday before uh, options expire just to look to see which direction it might behoove market makers. Um, maybe, maybe they likely will have some financial incentive to move prices in one direction or the other. And so we like to take a look at that from an index perspective to see where the S&P might go, where the NASDAQ might go. And then we also take a look from an individual stock perspective, trying to find and identify individual stocks that could make a significant move one way or the other based on options uh, activity. Anyway, all of that will be held later today at 4.30 p.m. Eastern. If you would like to join that event, um, it's one of our most popular events. It's one I really enjoy. Uh, anyway, it also takes as a no-cost trial. If you're not already an Earnings Beats member, you can attend tonight by starting a 30-day free trial. So simply click on the uh, link on the homepage and then hit the uh, Join Today button and then put your information in. You'll be set and uh, you can join us this evening for what should be a fairly educational event. At least I, I find it to be educational each month. All right, um, let's go ahead and jump into what happened on Monday. It was a not so great day, um, but we'd had a pretty good run, got up against resistance, got close to the 50 day moving average on some key indices and sectors. And as a result, I think we saw some profit taking. I'm not overly concerned about it. Um, you know, you're not gonna go up every day for sure, especially when you're in a bottoming process. But uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average did finish down 164 points, S&P 500 down 45, NASDAQ got hit the hardest, lost 263 points, mid caps down 27, small caps down 15. Overall, not a very good day. Monday, of course, I always talk about the Monday blues when it comes to the stock market. Interesting fact, if you're not aware of this, since 1950 on the S&P 500, Mondays have produced annualized returns of minus 14%. Think about that. That's one fifth of all trading days. Because you might think, well, with Monday, it's just one day. Well, it's one day every week. It's one out of five. So it's 20% or roughly 20% of all market days since 1950. That's a lot. It's like 14 years worth of data. Think about if we went down 14% every year for 14 years. Wouldn't be a very good feeling. That's the equivalent. That's what we've essentially done since 1950 on Mondays. So when I see the market rising one week and then we're down on Monday, it's like, okay, Monday blues. I don't really get too bent out of shape about it. Um, didn't really see anything technically that, that bothered me. I didn't like to, to see the discretionary group beaten up the way it was. I mean, you go down here and you can see the discretionary group down 2.74%, which was the second worst group. And you can see the three aggressive groups, uh, communication services down 3%, discretionary down 2.75, technology down 1.38. Those were your three worst. But when the market's going down, that's normal. Um, what I don't want to see is when the market's going up, these three groups lagging. That's, these should be leading when the market's going up, especially if I'm right about the market call that I made in June saying that the bottom was in. Um, defensive groups did better 
which again, on a down day, that's what we would normally expect. Utilities, the only group to gain ground on Monday, up about maybe two thirds of 1%, almost two thirds of 1%. Real estate was the second best group. It was flat, completely flat. But you can see all of these got up to the 50. Looks like we're trying to roll over on utilities. Real estate at this point, you know, struggling to get through recent highs around 42. And that's about where the 50 day comes in. That's at 42.29. And then communication services, discretionary technology, all of them, same issue, overhead price resistance in the 50 day, overhead price resistance in the 50 day, overhead price resistance in the 50 day. That's what we need to get through. And when we do, I think that is really setting this market up to go higher. So watch for it. We can't assume it's going to happen. I believe it's going to happen, but we need to see it. 10-year Treasury yield. Um, well, first thing I'll say is that, uh, let me go in and check on the, right now I'm showing down seven, it doesn't show it uh, just yet on stock charts, I don't believe, no. Um, but right now this morning in early action, the 10-year Treasury yield down seven-tenths of 1% to 2 point uh, or down seven basis points, down to 2.92%. Oil back down below $100 a barrel, down $4 overnight. So that to me is potentially the recipe for a strong move in the NASDAQ uh, on a relative basis. We'll see. I mean, last time we had that big move down in the yield, we saw what happened with the equities, especially the NASDAQ. So I would be thinking the same thing. As long as that 10-year Treasury yield starts to roll back over and move lower, I would be looking for the NASDAQ to maybe take charge and move higher. Um, futures are recovering. You know, As I speak, things are getting better and better. Uh, the Dow futures are down 200, S&P 500 futures down 20. But NASDAQ futures only down 11, so on a relative basis, doing much, much better. Um, anyhow, let's uh, take a look at some of the economic reports that will be out later this week. Tomorrow morning, June CPI. That has been a thorn in the side of the bulls for really more than the last year. But as inflation rises, that tends to be a very, very uh, bearish signal for U.S. equities. We don't want to see inflation. Now, I believe the action that's been taking place when you look at the 10-year Treasury yield, 348, yeah, we, we'd gone up quite a bit. Maybe you could argue for it to pull back a little bit. But 348 down to about 275, I'm not sure I call that a little bit. Uh, we went back and definitively broke below the 50-day, below the 20. And I'll tell you what, if we roll over here on the 10-year Treasury yield and go back down to a new low, that is going to have the look. And, and even on this bounce right here, Check out the PPO. It's just flat and it's below the, the center line. So it doesn't even appear that momentum's picking up with this move at all to the upside. If we roll back over and that PPO turns back down again, that really is painting a picture to me that the bond market is no longer concerned whatsoever about inflation. And the thing is, once the bond market turns its attention away from inflation and toward recession, that's when the Fed takes notice and potentially moves from hawkish to dovish. And once that happens, this bear market's over. I mean, I think it's over anyway, but this would be more a confirmation for me. This would confirm what I was already seeing on the charts based on rotation. Anyway, we do have June CPI coming out on Wednesday, so that you want to keep an eye out for that. Thursday, we've got June, uh, June PPI and initial jobless claims. So we'll get a couple of big reports there on Thursday. Friday, retail sales. So we haven't had much in the way of economic reports so far this week, but things are going to heat up uh, quite a bit here over the next two, three days with a couple of hot inflation reports likely to come out. And when I say hot, just hotter than what the Fed wants. Um, but we'll see how the market reacts to it. I think that's going to be the key more than the news itself. Um, and then retail sales on Friday. We're expecting a pretty big number. And I don't know, with a potential recession looming, I'd be a little concerned about whether we meet those 
re retail sales. June retail sales right now are expected to rise nine tenths of 1%. That just seems maybe a little optimistic at this point to me, but we'll see. Anyhow, uh, yeah, just keep an eye on the 10 year treasury yield. 270, I think is kind of like, like a line in the sand. It's hard for me to argue that the bond market is fearing inflation if we drop below 270. All right, next up, talking technically, uh, always like to look at the S&P. You know, here was the failure just above 3,900. Notice on the way down, 3,900 was support. We held that, went right through it mid-June, went to that last low, which I think is a bottom. And then on the recovery, got back up over just slightly above 3,900. Went back down. Notice we didn't put in a new low. And now we're right back up, challenging that 3,900 level again. Um, yesterday rolled over, closed below the 20-day. So if you're bearish, you should like the fact that you were able to close this below the 20-day. We got futures red. You want to see that accelerate to the downside and take out this recent support level. I don't know if we're going to do it. I have a feeling we're going to hold this recent support if we even get down that far. Um, and then I, I think we're going to break out above the 50 and potentially put in a bottoming head and shoulder pattern, reversing head and shoulder with this right here being the possible neckline coming across. So this would be your left shoulder in May, neckline, left side of the neckline. Then you had this, what I would call a capitulatory move. Some don't believe we capitulated. I think 41, almost 4,200 down to 3,600 and change in about six, seven trading days, volume increasing. I think that qualifies for me anyway. Um, but I do believe if we get back up here to about 4,150, especially if we can get just slightly above that left side of the neckline, I'd like to see an upsloping neckline, but anything up close to 4,200 with one final move back down to establish a right shoulder, that could be a very, very bullish bottoming pattern to confirm the rotation, the bullish rotation that we've already seen. So just throwing it out there as a possibility, and I don't say that's going to happen, but just looking at the charts, looking at the, the, the fact that I believe we bottomed, that could be a pattern that develops. I start looking for more bullish patterns when I'm bullish. I wasn't looking for bullish patterns back in February, March, April, May. But once I started to see rotation turn, now I'm bullish, and I'm going to start looking for those kinds of patterns. XRT, this is a very widely diversified retail ETF. With retail sales coming up, we'll see what happens here. I mean, it's been a long, steep decline. 102.5 back in November, down to 57.5 in you know, the beginning of July, potential double bottom. In order for this double bottom to confirm, we've got to go back up and clear this intermediate high in between. So I think you get up to 67, 50, 68. I think that would confirm this double bottom. Obviously, a breakdown below 57, 50 could lead to further selling in the retail area. All right, sector performance. I wanted to show you, this is something I showed last night uh, to the folks that attended our sneak preview of our model ETF uh, portfolio draft. That'll be next Tuesday. So we, what we do is we put a number of uh, ETFs into a portfolio and track them over the course of 90 days. Goal, of course, is to beat the S&P 500, which we've now done the last two quarters. But one, this is a part of the theme and part of what you need to be thinking about when you go into uh, establishing a model ETF portfolio of your own. When you are in a secular bull market, and I believe 2013, April 10th, when we cleared the 2000 and 2007 highs on the S&P 500, that occurred on April 10th, 2013. That is when I believe we confirmed the start of a secular bull market. From the date that we broke out on April 10th, all the way through the high it was right at the beginning of October of 2018. That was right when the trade war, um, that short cyclical bear market began. During this period, April 10th, 2013, to early October 2018, the S&P 500 gained 
the NASDAQ during the exact same period gained 168.5%. So let me put this in perspective. Let's say you had $100,000 and you were investing and you saw this breakout and you're like, okay, this is it, secular bull market, I'm jumping in. That 100,000 in the spider would have grown to approximately 185,000, up 85%. That same 100,000, if you invested in the QQQ, would have been up to 268,000 instead of 185,000. Choices are very important in terms of determining your financial future. You need to recognize when you're in these secular bull markets because certain investments do a lot better. Now, some of you might say, well, I can't take that risk. That's fine, but you still allocate. Maybe you have a small percentage that you put in the NASDAQ to try to up your return a little bit. Or you might say, you know what? I don't want any of the NASDAQ. It's too volatile. I'm going to stick with the S&P. You can make that call. That's fine. My point here is you need to have the knowledge to make these decisions. When you're in a secular bull market, look at what leads. NASDAQ crushes S&P 500. IWF crushes the IWD. That's... Um, uh, a large cap growth versus large cap value, 134% versus 76%. The aggressive sectors, technology, communication services, and consumer discretionary, look at how much they gained. Look at the defensive groups, way, way short of these aggressive groups. So when you're putting together a portfolio, if you believe you're in a secular bull market, you want to skew your investments you know, if you're trying to beat the S&P 500, one thing you could do is simply weight these aggressive sectors higher than they're weighted in the S&P 500. So for instance, the XLK is weighted at about 28%. Technology is about 28% of the S&P 500. So right now in our model portfolio, we have 35% in the XLK. We made that adjustment back in mid-June when we thought the market bottom was in. So once we believe that we're going to start rolling back to the upside, we want to configure our portfolios to best be positioned to benefit from that secular bull market. Now, I want you to look at what happens during cyclical bear markets. There was the trade war, fourth quarter of 2018. Here's the 2022 cyclical bear market. I believe cyclical bear market that's already ended. That's what I believe. Feel free to disagree. No problem. During a cyclical bear market, I want you to look at the ratios here. Now the NASDAQ is underperforming down 23% versus 20%. Large cap growth underperforms, goes down more than the value. The aggressive sectors go down more than the defensive groups. So when you, if you can recognize a cyclical bear market, as I talked about back on December 31st, right here, if you can recognize that ahead of time. And if you want to stay invested, just reposition into more defensive areas, you can outperform the S&P 500. We've been fully invested in equities and US equities in our model ETF portfolio this year. And we're about six percentage points better than the S&P 500 in 2022. And we've been fully invested in those portfolios. That's one of the things that, you know, one of the parts of our strategy is that we stay fully invested no matter what. Now, you can make the decision when I start talking about tops back at the end of the year, you can say, hey, I'm just going to sit it out, move the cash. Completely up to you. But these portfolios are designed for buy and holders. That was the reason they were established in the first place. Not to trade, not to try to time the market. So what we do is we simply rotate as best we can to outperform. Well, now that I believe the bottom's in, guess what we're going to probably do next week? We're going to be much more aggressive in how we allocate. So it's just important. I mean, you can see during the cyclical bear market, NASDAQ down eight points, percentage points more than the S&P 500. Large cap growth down 32%. Large cap value 17 and a half. Uh, XLK, XLC, XLY, all down 30% or more. XLU, 9%. XLP, 11%. XLRE, real estate, yeah, that one's gotten hit pretty good, down 24%. But all three, much better than the three aggressive groups. So when you're going into a more, you know, more 
bearish period. Listen, the signals that I gave, it's easy to sit back and say now, oh, you should have been in cash. These are signals that are not guarantees. You know, the market could have just taken back off again and aggressive groups led. And, you know, you're sitting in cash and you're buy and hold, then what do you do? The point is, again, buy and hold, you don't try and time it. Now, you might make personal decisions in your own account to say, I want to put X in cash. I want to put X in bonds, X in stocks. And then you might look to earnings beats and say, well, the X I put in stocks, I'll look, you know, this is what I'm going to do with it. Make your own cash call. You know, nobody's got your hands tied behind your back, forcing you to put all your money into stocks and keep it there. That's a personal decision. But if you are going to invest and the market does look riskier than normal, you might want to think about defensive areas. But now things are turning back around. I think we bottomed. I think 3636 was the print. And I'm expecting we're going to go higher from here. I do not think we're going to take out that low. Again, that's just my belief. We'll see what happens. Um, but if I'm right and we start to move back up, I can pretty much assure you, I can't guarantee it, but Normally, what would happen would be we would go back to this kind of performance sectors. So anyway, I just wanted to point that out. I thought it was really interesting going over it last night. I wanted to share with everybody. All right, let's keep moving on. Uh, let's go to earnings spotlight. So earnings spotlight, uh, Pepsi reported this morning, and they had a really good report. Of course, it is in a little bit more defensive area, staples, um, you know, soft drinks. Anyway, Pepsi reported revenues of $20.23 billion versus expectation of $19.51 billion. Easy beat on the top line. Bottom line, 186 versus 173. Again, an easy beat. They raised their revenue guidance for the year, for the second straight quarter, by the way. And what's interesting, they haven't raised their bottom line. So it might be that their costs are going up, but they're seeing enough business to offset it. That's the way I would interpret it anyway. They are up a little bit more than 1% this morning in pre-market. I would have thought maybe a bigger move, but uh, it is still up a little bit. AD line, very strong. Looks to me like stock's being accumulated, even though we're not going higher in price. Been going mostly sideways. Um, but if you look down here, you can see Pepsi significantly outperforming the S&P 500. Soft drinks significantly outperforming the S&P 500, but Pepsi relative to its peers actually peaked all the way back at the beginning of December. And we've been mostly just flat. So the way to interpret this when you're looking at the chart is, hey, I've got a great group, soft drinks, really strong relative to the S&P, and Pepsi's going along for the ride. It's just been flat relative to its peers. So essentially, if I was looking at this, I'd be, it would almost look like someone's got Pepsi by the shoulders, just dragging it higher or dragging it on a relative basis higher versus the S&P 500. So this is kind of what I'm looking at here. So I just think it's the group is so strong. It's pulling Pepsi with it. Pepsi has not really been performing as a leader within the group yet came through with a great earnings report. So this bodes really well, I think, for Coke. KO, when you see Coke report, Coke is performing better than Pepsi, and I would be expecting a really good report out of Coke based on what we just saw out of Pepsi. Um, other earnings, let's take a look at a few other earnings coming up later this week. So we're going to get Fastenal out. This is a group that's in the industrial suppliers area. Look at the AD line up near 52-week high, price down near 52-week low. Relative strength, you can see just recently hit a 52-week high. So when I look at a stock like this going into earnings, I would say, well, for the sake of industrial suppliers, let's hope Fastenal has a good report. Because if this is one of the best stocks in the group, according to Wall Street, and they miss their estimates, that wouldn't be a very good sign. I think Fastenal is going to hit their estimates. Probably has already bottomed down here at the 48, 49 area. Um, that would be my guess going into earnings. We'll see what happens. Delta Airlines reports. Uh, this is, these are tomorrow, stocks that report tomorrow. 
Delta Airlines reports now in this case, AD line that looks weak. Look at the relative strength over the last five or six weeks, really poor, going from a 52 week high down to about a seven month low. So I don't know, volume trends pretty weak, AD line, like I said, weak. I'm not expecting much out of Delta. Um, give you one stock for Thursday because this is when we kick off with earnings season. And I think JP Morgan is the one, um, you know, that's the one to me that really kicks earnings season off. It's been downtrending really since all the way back in October. Um, AD line not looking particularly good. Started to show a little bit of rel uh, relative strength, but that seems to be rolling over. Banks relative to the S&P, not good. You know, I don't think the report's going to be good, but the reaction's going to be interesting because if we get a lot of buying, a big hollow candle after they report what I would expect to be not so great news, let's say we gap down to 110. Or maybe we can go a little lower and then we print a big hollow candle where we get a lot of buying coming in with volume. That could mark a bottom. Something to think about. All right, let's wrap this thing up with three you must see. I'm going to start off with Twitter. Uh, Twitter, of course, the deal with Musk and, and uh, Tesla seems to be falling through. Does not look like this is going to go through and the market reacting to it. Here was where the announcement came out. We thought we had a deal. And we were up to almost $55. Now we're back to 32, getting close to the 52 week low. That's the problem with these potential acquisitions and chasing that kind of news is look what happens when the deal doesn't go through. You lose a lot of money, you get caught up in all that excitement and emotion to the upside and then lose this kind of money. Anyway, not looking good there for Twitter. I see a test of maybe around 31 bucks coming. Wynn Resorts, gambling stocks have been horrible. Look at Wynn. Every time it goes up, it goes right back down again. Now, yesterday it did look like it might close at a new low, but then rebounded on some pretty good volume. So maybe, maybe we've put a bottom in here. I'd like to see this hold $50. That's that intraday low from a few weeks ago. Let's see if that holds. And then the last one I want to show you is the actual gambling chart. So let's pull up the Dow Jones U.S. Gambling Index. The same chart on the daily, but what I wanted to point out is the weekly. If you look at the weekly, and I'm even going to go back further, this five year, I'm going to go back 20 years, basically this century. And the tops pretty clearly come in at 1,100. That's major resistance. We're at 434. And we're about as oversold as we have been at any point in the last 10, 12, 13 years. Look at the PPO, weekly PPO, down close to the pandemic low. We have turned just beneath 450 on multiple occasions, and we're at 434 right now. So we're close to an area where we typically do bounce back. So I would be looking for some good things to come in the gambling area and maybe win resorts on a false breakdown Maybe it's time for this group, but I know it's hard if you're a momentum trader to get into it on the long side. I'd like to see maybe a little reversal first. Anyway, that's it for me again tonight. We have Max Payne. Love to have you come over to earningsbeats.com. Click on that no cost trial button right there and get your 30 day trial started. Hope to see you tonight. Happy trading, everybody. Hey, Grayson Rose here with Stock Charts. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, consider giving it a like down below, maybe leave us a comment. And if you're new to the channel, you can subscribe at the link up above. We're gonna bring you daily content from an incredible collection of technical analysts and financial experts.